Hello and welcome a second week here from our home. Uh, my name is Ned Bernstein, pastor at Norval Community Baptist Church. And if you would, grab your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 22. And let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for all that you try to accomplish in each of our lives. And we know that this is a, a time of great distress for a lot of people around the world, but we know that you're in control and that uh, your hand is upon everything. And as we take a look into your scripture today, Lord, I pray that you'd, you'd give me the right words to speak as I always pray, that uh, as I open my mouth, that every word would be directed by you. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. So if you, as you turn into Luke chapter 22, this, of course, is Palm Sunday weekend. It's the, uh, the, the triumphal entry of, of Jesus into Jerusalem. It's, yeah, it's mentioned in all four of the Gospels. And, and as amazing thing is Jesus is, is coming into Jerusalem. He's riding on a young colt of a donkey. And people are coming out in vast multitudes and they're throwing down palm branches in front of him as he's riding into Jerusalem. Uh, in some of the scripture, it even says they were taking off their coats. They were throwing clothes down. It was, uh, it was as though royalty was coming into Jerusalem. And that's how a lot of people were, were looking at Jesus as the, as the king. And so they were welcoming him into Jerusalem as, the, as a, like a conquering king. But isn't it amazing how things can change in just a, a few days' time? It's, you know, we, we see in this week leading up to, to Resurrection Sunday that he's, he's betrayed, he's, uh, he's crucified. He, all these things, they're, they're leading into this, this, uh, final, this final week. It's the greatest week ever recorded in the history of of all mankind and things change in a heart heartbeat the multitudes are welcoming men they're hailing him as the king of israel they, they're crying out hosanna and and all these things that but the, the problem is the nation as a whole really wasn't looking for a messiah that was a spiritual savior they were looking for a Messiah king that would deliver them from the, the Roman government's oppression. But by late Thursday night, early Friday morning, he was betrayed by Judas, falsely accused by the religious leaders who refused to accept him. And he was handed over to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, then to King Herod, and then back to Pilate, where he had been beaten beyond recognition. And now the multitudes were shouting, crucify him. This morning I seen early on the news early in the morning, it was telling about a whole group of people out in the Grand Canyon that were, that were rafting down through there on a 24 day adventure and they had no cell service. So 21 days into this, they all of a sudden get word from the outside how the entire country has been locked down and how the coronavirus has totally overtaken our land. And they were totally in shock when they heard this. Can you imagine what they felt in Jerusalem and in the nation of Israel? That on Sunday, Jesus comes into town and he's being hailed as the king. And later in a week, so maybe some of the same people that were shouting out Hosanna, maybe some of these same people are in the crowd yelling, crucify him. Well, I want us to take a look at Luke chapter 22. And we're going to start at verse 66. And this is after Jesus has already been arrested during the night. He's been falsely accused. He's been arrested Every law that could possibly be broken has been broken when the, the, the Sanhedrin has taken place here. And they come and they, they privately haul him away in the middle of the night. They've beaten him. Uh, they've blindfolded him. They, they're telling him to prophesy, who is it that struck you? Well, I, I want us to look down starting at verse 66. As soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. 
But he said to them, If I tell you what you will by no means believe, and if I also ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. So here are these people, and this is Pharisees, this is everybody. This, these are the leaders, the religious leaders of that day, the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders, chief priests. They're all gathered around him. And, and they're asking, if you are the Christ, let us know. Tell us. And are you the Son of Man? Well, the Son of Man, you know, Jesus is the Son of God. He left heaven. He came down. He took the form of man to identify with us. Before he was to go to the cross, he had to leave, come down, take on the manhood that we all experience as, as being human beings, that he was both God and he was both man at the same time. And so they further ask here in verse 70, Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God, and he said, You rightly say that I am. So what he's, he's saying here, he says that uh, you, you know who I am. So you're asking me, are you the Christ? Are you the Son of God? And he said, you, you've, you said it correctly. That's the way he responded back to them. You said it correctly. The very ones who studied the Holy Scripture that should have known exactly who he was more than anybody else, more than the, the, the poor people and everybody else in the land, maybe the, the uneducated, these people above all else should have known who he was. But they weren't looking for this Messiah. They refused to accept and believe in him regardless of all the miracles that they had saw with their eyes, and now Jesus answers their question, yes, I am exactly who you say or you ask that I am. And now they want to put him to death. Now if you turn back to Matthew chapter 16, which is really kind of the heart of the message here, and really what I feel the Lord is speaking to, to every single one of us, to I know he spoke to me many years ago, and I, I know he's speaking to all of you that are watching this video right now. And this is, this is sometime earlier. The disciples have been with Jesus for several years now. They followed him around. They've, they've been a part of miracles. They've seen great things happen. In fact, there was one place where it says that, uh, says that not only did Jesus send out his 12 disciples, but he sent, sent an additional 70 disciples other followers also out and they went out and they performed mighty wonders in the name of Jesus they even cast out demons even even healed some people so he's asking his inner circle here a question here in verse 13 of chapter 16 of Matthew when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi he asked his disciples saying who do men say that I the son of man am He's, he's asking them, he says, uh, you guys are out and about and you're with everybody. What do the people say when you hear people talking? Who do they think I am? Who do they say they think I am? And it's always amazing that the responses that people will give. So we look at verse 14. So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Well, you know the old saying, believe half of what you see and none of what you hear. I, I find it kind of humorous that anybody would say John the Baptist. John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus. He was Jesus' cousin. He baptized Jesus. He was recently beheaded by King Herod. Aren't you kind of puzzled that anybody out there would say, well, perhaps this is John the Baptist. The, the nation as a whole, they didn't believe in anything like reincarnation, and they existed at the same time. And let's, let's look at the other responses. Some say Elijah or others, Jeremiah, or one of the Old Testament prophets, you know. They knew about these great men of God from the Old Testament, but there wasn't nobody 
nobody that even come in comparison to what the things that Jesus did or the claims that he made. Nobody had opened blind eyes. And so he, he asked them a question, is you're out with the people, who do they say that I am? And then he asked probably one of the greatest questions that have ever been asked. And I believe that for every one of us that ever comes to Christ and totally puts our trust in him as Lord and Savior, I believe that every single one of us feel this prompting of the Holy Spirit. Verse 15, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? He had the leaders. They, they, they knew who he was. They didn't accept him. They flat out rejected him. He's hearing what the, the people in the area say, that you know maybe he's one of the prophets. But he asked his inner circle here. He says, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, verse 16, answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'll tell you what, the Holy Spirit has been sent out to draw people unto him. And, and, and Peter's response here, is that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus replies back and says in verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, the scripture makes it very clear that nobody comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws them. His response was a direct response that the Holy Spirit sent from the Father has, has opened Jesus' mind and his heart up for him to make that declaration of faith. In, in 2 Peter 3.9, Peter says from his own experience that the Lord is long-suffering and he's not willing that any should perish and that all should come to repentance. You know, we we got to recognize who Jesus is. In John chapter 1, he's, he's recognized that he was there at creation. In the beginning was the Word. The Word is with God. The Word was God. All things that were made by him, there was not anything made that was made. In verse 14 of chapter 1 of John, and it says that the Word became, became flesh and dwelt among us. It lets us know that that, that Word that's, that is God and was with God is also Jesus. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, you know, there's a declaration there at the beginning of crea creation where it says, uh, let us make man in our image, plural, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So we, we see these things that identify who Jesus Christ really is. And, and when, we, when we come to Christ, we're recognizing the one that made us, the one that made all that there is that has ever been made is the one that made us. And he's also the one that went to the cross for us, the one that took our sins to the cross. And, and so it, it's, it's, it's understandable to, under, to, to look at this that Peter makes a statement the Lord is long-suffering, and he doesn't want anybody to perish. All, all that he has created, all of mankind, you know, it, it claims in Genesis that, you know, when, when man was made, that he breathed into man a living soul. Now, that soul is going to go on for eternity, whether with God or, or not with God. And so it's his will that none should perish but God doesn't force anybody to accept him. He gives us all free will. And I, I believe that in the fact that God wants all of us to be saved, God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. People put themselves in hell, not God. Do, do you, does everybody understand that uh, with free will, we're given a choice to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? Well, what about the person that thinks, well, I, I'm, I'm a really good person and uh, I've done a lot of good in my life and I, I'm not choosing Jesus, but if there is a heaven and I get there, I believe I'll get in there just because of what I did. 
So this person on their own merits say, I'm a good person. But by not accepting what Jesus Christ did for us and what he, the sacrifice that he made for our sins, the person that does that is making a choice by not making a choice. Because you only have two options. You're either with God or you're not. It goes on and it says uh, in Matthew twenty-two fourteen, 14, it says, For many are called and few are chosen. Many, the whole world has been called. The, 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 the offer of salvation has been given to all of mankind, all of creation. But he said the sad thing is, many are called, but few are chosen. And in order for us to be part of that chosen, is we have to respond to the Holy Spirit as he moves on us, just like he responded to Peter, where Peter, Peter cried out and he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I remember that day back 40-some years ago when I didn't have a whole lot of knowledge of who God was. But in a trial in our lives, I remember feeling God calling me. And I didn't even know how to respond to him. And I accepted him into my life as my Lord and Savior. And that's the call that God has that he has sent out. As Peter said, God doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. But at the same time, he knows that not everybody's going to respond to that call. It's my plea to everybody watching this video today, your living room, wherever you're at. If you're out there today and you're not sure, you're not sure. You're not sure, like, like Peter, when he made that declaration of faith. You know, he, we, we see the difference between what the religious leaders, they had a head knowledge, they had more knowledge about who the Messiah was than the people that were accepting him. They knew all the prophecies of the Old Testament, all the way from Genesis, all the way leading up to the, to the birth of Christ. They knew what all those prophecies said, and it was impossible for anybody else to fulfill those fulfilled prophecies other than the person of Jesus Christ. They knew that. They had a head knowledge. They rightly said, Jesus said, you have rightly said that I am he. But they were lost. They were lost because we can reject Christ by not opening our heart to what he has done for us. When Peter answered Jesus' question by faith, he was putting his trust in the very one that had created him. He had become first place in Lord of his life. All of eternity depends on how you answer the question. Is Jesus just someone on your list of things in your life? Or is he at the top of the list? If he is not Lord over everything, then you have to ask the question, then maybe he's not Lord at all. And if you're listening today, I, I send out this heartfelt plea, and I know I know that I have a lot of friends and, and family that are probably watching this video right now. And I love all of you. And I know there's probably people watching that I don't know. And as a minister of the gospel, all I want to do is see people come to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we have to answer that question. And the question isn't coming from me today, but I'm being prompted by the Holy Spirit to ask you on behalf of Jesus himself. And he's speaking to every single person that's watching right now. Who do you say that I am? And I, I hope and pray that every person watching today, you don't just say, well, he, he's, a, he's a great guy. All the religions of the world know who he is. He's, he's the most celebrated individual in the history of all mankind. There's, there's never been anything like it. 2,000 years ago, even our calendars, everything has been set by who Jesus Christ is. But a lot of people don't recognize him as being the one that left heaven, came down, took the form of man, and was beaten beyond recognition and crucified for us. 
I want to close in prayer today. I know this is this is a short message, but I, I want this to. I don't know how many people or who's who's watching this, but I, I my prayer right now is the Holy Spirit is speaking to somebody out there today. And and if you're out there listening today and you you believe in Jesus, but you're not sure that you've ever really totally surrendered your life completely unto Him. I would ask you as we pray together that as you pray with me, I pray that your commitment would be real. God's not offended if you're asking and you want to pray again to make sure in your life. If you're out there and you're not sure if Jesus Christ is number one in your life, then I would ask everybody to pray with me now. Let's bow together in prayer. Lord, I believe that you are who that you said that you are, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that you were there at the very beginning in creation, that you are, as the scripture says, God Almighty come in the flesh. I believe that. And I believe that you, when you left heaven, you came down and, and you took the form of man and you took the most cruelest punishment ever imaginable. You did it on your own. That you went to the cross that day and you became a sacrifice for the sins of me along with everybody else in the world. Your Holy Scripture says that we're all sinners, that we all fall short. There's none of us righteous, not one person, that, that you took our place on that cross. I believe that today, and I want to ask you, Lord, to forgive me of my sins. I ask you, Lord, to come into my life to be my Lord and Savior, that one day when I leave this earth that I will stand in your presence and I'll be welcome into your company as your child. I just ask, Lord, that you would remember me and, and I would be in heaven with you someday. And I do believe today that you are my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you sincerely prayed that prayer today, and you've put your trust in him as your Lord and Savior, then I would ask that you might please respond back in some way, give a thumbs up, whatever, respond back in some way and say, yes, today I truly, truly believe, and God can't go against his own word, that, that you truly accepted him and you are his child no matter what. I would ask you to respond back. I look forward to speaking to you again next week as we we take a look at uh, Good Friday and, and what happened on Resurrection Sunday, the greatest event in the history of all mankind. Thank you for listening to me once again. Look forward to talking to you again next week. Take care and God bless and be safe out there. Bye for now.